Hi, if you like the video, please remember to subscribe. Hi, I'm Rob from RobNonFoto.com and in today's video we're going to be looking at the Pentax K1000, an absolutely fantastic fully manual 35mm film SLR from um, the 70s to the 90s that is uh, incredibly popular, um, incredibly cheap, incredibly reliable and incredibly good. Um, the Pentax K1000 um, has all the features of a really good um, manual focus film SLR. Um, it's got through the lens metering. So what that means is you know, when, when you go to take a picture and you look at the little light meter that's built into it, you don't have to do any stopping down with the lens. You don't have to play around. You know, It, it allows for that. Um, it's got an okay viewfinder, um, not the brightest in the world, but, but you know, it's good enough. It's got a great selection of lenses that's still available second hand, and it's got the great Pentax um, heritage. And although these cameras might be from sort of 20 to 40 years old, chances are um, it's probably still working and it'll teach you more about photography as it slows you down and makes you really learn the exposure triangle of uh, aperture shutter speed and your, your film iso um, and it'll teach you more than really probably more than like a dozen books or, or magazines on digital photography the um, k1000 feels great in the hand it really does we've got um, virtually a completely solid metal body i don't think i'm not sure if that bit's metal um, this particular one is quite an early model because it's an asahi Pentax K1000, where the later ones are just called Pentax um, K1000. It does away with uh, lots of those advanced features that you'll find on other SLRs of the period, such as mirror lockup. Um, there's no depth of field preview either. And what this means is you don't kind of get distracted by these things. Now, I love my SRT 101, my Minolta camera, but I've got to admit that sometimes when you're out shooting, because it kind of has the, I think it has the depth of field preview button there. And it has a um, film delay there. Sometimes you catch them with your finger. Actually, the one that happens with the SRT 101 is it has a mirror lock up, and you catch that with your finger. The mirror locks up, and you can't see anything. You're like, what's, what's going on? I've taken the lens cap off, so that can be a pain. But the Pentax K1000 doesn't have any of that. Um, and so you, you just kind of concentrate on taking the pictures and don't get distracted by other things. Um, and especially if you're used to modern digital cameras, or even you know some of the later film cameras, kind of the last of the lines, the metal body of something like the K1000 really is a, a, a revolution. But maybe it's just, you know just the weight of it. You know, it's the feel. You know, when you when you when you take a picture, you know that mechanical sound. When you're changing the shutter speed or the aperture um, settings, you know those mechanical clicks. You feel a lot more part of the whole photographic process when you lose using a camera like this. Um, you feel like you know you're the one who's making all the decisions. It's a very analog type of sensation really really tactile and it can be really quite addictive using a camera like this and you know another piece of the magic about the k1000 is that although it was the entry level camera in the, the pentax range when they introduced it in 1976 the k1000 you could say really has outlived all of its more complicated stable brothers because it stayed in production till 1997 and it was only really the fact that things like the uh, the bits they needed to make the light meters became difficult to to get hold of that, that they stopped production. Um, and uh, the reason why it was so popular is because you know it was really cheap for for what it was. Um, so uh, very reliable as well. So it was great for students. Um, it's a perfect learning tool, you know, and it's still a great camera and a great learning tool today. So you know, if you want to learn about the technicalities of photography. ISO, shutter speed, um, aperture, without any electronic getting in the way, you know, and you weren't, and you want to learn kind of how to slow down to, to improve your photography, you can't really go wrong with the K1000. And chances are, if you know sort of uncles or aunts or relatives who were into photography, they probably got one of them at least will have a K1000 hidden away somewhere, um, uh, collecting dust that you can. You can uh, grab off them, borrow off them, maybe even buy off them, and then slap a roll of film in it and have some fun. Now, this particular model I've got here 
um, K1000. So it's one of the earlier ones. And I picked it up with the 50mm f1.7 SMC Pentax M lens, lens on. You know, and it seems pretty sharp. I've done plenty of shooting with it and I, you know, really enjoy it. So what we're going to do now, let's turn the camera around. Let's do a quick screencast and look at um, where, you know, the best place to, not the best place to buy them, but where, you know, what sort of prices should you be looking at on eBay um, and what to look for when you buy one to make sure um, you get something that actually, actually works. All right, so let's dive in and have a quick look at eBay to see what you could uh, get a Pentax K1000 for, you know, if you wanted to buy one off the base. So, what have we got? So, on eBay.co.uk, I've done a quick search for Pentax K1000. I've changed it to ending soonest, and let's see what we've got. Got something ending in nine hours, going for thirty-six pounds, fifteen bids. So, it's probably going to go for a little bit more. What else have we got down here? Oh, one with quite a lot of lenses there, going for £113. Um, that's quite a lot, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, we've got 20 bids, one day left, £64. Pentax with 50mm, going for £10.99, uh, one day left. So there we go. So that's, if you were to buy one off the eBay, you could probably look at those sorts of prices. K1000 in America. Let's have a look. Again, I've just done a search for Pentax K1000 ending soonest. Well, there's one with quite a lot of stuff there. $65.45 with three hours left. $41, 18 bids, four hours left. There's one with loads of stuff. 50mm lens, 75 to 260. Looks like there's a flash in there, a light meter, $75. Ooh, someone being a bit optimistic, $145. Anyway, that kind of um, gives you an idea of what you could expect to pay uh, on uh, on eBay. Um, should you want to um, should you want to buy one off uh, off there? However, I would you know suggest that one of the best ways of uh, grabbing a K1000 is you know off relatives, ask around see who else has got one, and keep an eye out for them at car boot sales, um, thrift stores, charity shops, all that sort of stuff. Because you're amazed when you pick one up. Um, but you know the next kind of question is, what should you look for when, um, when when you buy one? So I'd say the first thing to do really would be just have a good look at the body. What condition does it look like? Are there any big dents, um, big scratches? Um, does it look like it's been dropped or anything like that? As you can see in this particular one, you know, it's a little bit dirty, but there's no obvious signs of impact, um, impact damage. Um, and then next thing I would do is if you, I mean, obviously ask if you're a car boot sale or in a charity shop, you know, ask them if it's okay for you to, to do the things. Next thing I would say would be to um, slide, the, um, slide the lens off. You press that little lever down there. And then you can turn the lens, slide the lens off, you know, have a good look at the lens. And what you want to do is, you won't be able to see this on the video, if I slide that in and out, you should be able to see the aperture changing. You see the aperture changing? Like that. And we're just making sure that it goes all the way down to the smaller setting and all the way open. Quite often, older cameras get sticky aperture blades just because of the lubricants in there. You know, after 20, 30 years, they get, they get a bit sticky and they won't work. Turn that focusing ring. You know, does that nice and smooth? This lens seems pretty good. Have a look at it. You're going to see dust. You're going to see specks. You might even see a little bit of mold, which is almost like a a rippling effect. It doesn't look like little mushrooms or anything like that. But you know, it, unless it's really bad, as long as you can see through it, you know, just go for it. And just pop the lens back on. Obviously, have a look through it. Um, can you see through the viewfinder? When you turn that um, aperture ring and the focus ring, is it nice and smooth? Um, so the viewfinders can be a bit dirty, especially if it's something that's been sitting in the back of somebody's uh, closet for the last 20 years. But, you know, they're easy to clean up. Um, check the film advance. Does it wind on? Does it fire? Seems nice. What you want to do with the... Um, with the shutter speed dial that's here, you know, set it to a thousandth of a second, like so. Fire off the shutter a couple of times, and then set it to, I don't know, fifteenth of a second. You hear the difference, can't you? You know, so I'm not saying that that shutter speed will be accurate, but at least you can hear a difference um, when you take a, when you fire it off. 
You know, does the mirror slap up and down? Um, what you've also got underneath the shutter dial is you've got the, the, the tool for changing the aperture. And all you do is just pull the ring up and turn that. Does that turn nicely? Excellent. Um, the little um, lever on the kind of left hand side, can you pop that up? Can you pull the, that up? You know, does it does it turn? It seems to work, doesn't it? Let's turn the camera upside down. And then we can just check for the battery compartment. And we can check to see whether the film... Basically, that button there is the film rewind knob. So if we tap that, then the film would film would rewind. We're not about doing it now. And then let's pop the back open. Let's pop the back open. You just pull that lever up. You know, and let's just have a look. We can even um, look at the shutter firing. Remember, don't touch the shutter in here. You don't want to damage it. Excellent. Um, it's all very, very clean. No marks. No sign of water has got in there. Everything seems to be working fine visually. Now the next thing we can do is check the light meter. Now the light meter on K1000 is, is on all the time. Um, as soon as you take the lens cap off, it's working. And so all you really want to do is you just want to look through the look through the lens. And you should see a needle over on the right hand side. And just point it towards something bright. And you should see the needle wander up and down. Then as you change your aperture or your shutter speed, you'll see the needle move. And you, the, the idea is that you get the needle in the middle. And if it works, great. You know, if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If you've got a screwdriver with you, in fact, which I haven't now, pop the bottom off, take the battery compartment off, um, and you should find a couple of batteries in there. If the batteries have leaked, uh, it's not the end of the world, because remember, this is a fully mechanical camera, so it doesn't need the light meter to work. If it's leaked, you know, you'd knock some money off it. If they haven't leaked, then they're just flat, take them out. They're LR, you can put LR44s in them, so you get a couple of them and put them in there. But remember, being a fully mechanical camera, the uh, Pentax K1000, you could just use an external light meter, or you can just use the Sunny 16 to meter your photographs. It's not. It doesn't matter if the light meter doesn't work in it at all. And I guess, you know, the thing that I would say is this camera, you know, could be almost 40 years old. It's probably, it will be at least 20 years old, I would say. So be gentle with them, you know, and just don't be too picky either. As long as the mechanics work, then the camera is usable. Um, and even if the light meter turns out not to work, you can still use an external light meter. But I guarantee one thing. If you do pick up one of these cameras at a car boot sale and you haven't looked through the lens of an SLR, digital or otherwise, and you use the compacts, as soon as you look through that viewfinder of something like a 50mm lens and you can see that depth of field when you focus on something close to you and then the rest is out of, uh, out of focus, you'll be like, this is brilliant, you know. Now, I personally have a rule at car boots that I very, very rarely spend more than... 15 pounds or 20 pounds on the camera because often although you do all these tests you don't know if it's really going to work when you get it home um i would say at a car boot sale in the uk i probably wouldn't pay more than the 10 pounds for one unless it came with lots of different lenses um and um because you know you just don't know there's probably another one down the road but saying that you know if you see one i would say if you see one saw, saw one at a car boot sale and it worked and you know somebody wanted a tenner for it uh, with the lens, I would give them a tenner, hundred percent. And if you get it for any less, happy days. A little bit more, you know, maybe try it and haggle them down. So there we go. So that's what you would look for. Um, and as I said, be gentle with them. They are old, but they're pretty tough little cameras. And uh, always remember that when you finish playing with it, I've dropped mine. Here it is. Always put your lens cap on to uh, stop your battery going flat in your light meter. All right. So next up. Um, let's have a look at how you actually use the Pentax K1000 to take some photographs. Okay, so you know how do you actually use the Pentax uh, K1000 to take photos? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to load some film into this little baby. So uh, what have we got here? Let's get some Wilford FP4125 film, and let's open the back up. Try and do this whenever you're loading film. Always try and do it in a situation where there isn't too much light around. Um, you know, in the shade, you want to be doing. You don't want to be doing this in bright sunshine. And then all we want to do is you pull you pull your leader out, and then what you can see in here is the same on all kind of 35 millimeter film cameras. There's like a a roll, and it'll have a little, some little teeth in that will kind of engage and stuff. So the, <laughs> what I always do, I just stuff stuff your leader through that bit. Uh, in fact, let's just turn it a little bit. Put that through there. Like that, so it engages. 
and let's just refire the shutter. Wind it on, see it's gone all the way around there. And then we can pop that down, close the back. And here's a little, here's a little hint to make sure you, you wound it on correctly. What you, what, you, what you look for isn't really what it says here on your shutter counter. You want to check this moves because if this moves, you know you've loaded your film correctly. So let's see. Just taking out the slack, nothing. See if it's going to start moving. Right, this should start moving in a second. There we go. See it move? Watch it move when I wind on. That way I know 100% that this film is loaded correctly and it's going to be going through because there's nothing worse. Well, there are worse things, but it's not very nice if you do load uh, some film and uh, you shoot away, shoot away, and it's a 36 roll and you're like past 36 and then you realise that you haven't loaded the film correctly. So there we go. So that film's in there. Um, we're ready to shoot now. Um, don't worry, this isn't. A, this is a, just like a test roll of film I have. Okay, so we've got our film in. So the next thing to do would be to um, set the ISO of the film. Now we set that with this little bit here. Probably a bit difficult to see, but what you're looking to do is, I mean, I've just put ISO 100, basically film in there. So you just pull this bit up and turn it until you get to where are we? 100, 300. I've gone past 32. 64, 100. Well, it's, I guess it's 125. 100 is close enough. So I've set my ISO on my film. Being film, obviously, we, once we got a film in, we can't change the ISO. We're stuck there. So I've set my ISO. Let's take our cap off. We're ready with our subject. Now, at this point, we could meter manually if we wanted. Say we're out and about um, and we go, oh, it's a sunny day. Sunny day, what do you do? You set your camera to F16. And to set the aperture, you just turn that dial there so the red line matches up with. F16 and you set your shutter speed to 1 over your ISO so I've got one ISO 100 film in so I just set my shutter speed to well I've got 125 and so it's set it to 125 there we go and on a sunny day outside that will give me perfectly exposed photographs if it goes a little bit dull I could do a couple of things I could either open up my aperture or stop so you go down to something like F11 or F8 or I could um, half my shutter, sorry, double my shutter speed to a 60th, or if it gets really, really sunny, really, really bright, I could go up to 250 of a second, nice and easy. However, if the light meter is working on your K1000, you probably want to use that. And what I tend to say is, you know, choose your aperture roughly for the artistic effect you want to go. And with film cameras, manual film cameras, you, and you're just wandering around, you can't really go wrong if you remember the phrase, F8 and B there. So set your aperture to F8 as you're wandering around. There we go. And all you do is you put your camera up to the, your eye, focus on your subject, and you're looking for your needle, which is over on the right hand side. I'm just going to point it towards a brighter thing. And then all you do is you then adjust your shutter speed to get that needle in the middle. Once it's in the middle, wind, wind your film on first, take the photo. It's that easy. If the needle goes too far down, just change your shutter speed to get it back in the middle. If it goes too far up, change your shutter speed. Now, you will get to a point, obviously, when you go past the um, point at which the shutter um, uh, works anymore. Uh, sorry, the, the needle works anymore because you'll start running out of shutter speed. And that is the point when you um, start um, using... Um, that's when the point when you, you'd start changing your aperture. So, you know, if it was a really bright day and you're F8 and you're running, starting to run out of shutter speed, that's when you'd start to push it to like F16 or F22. Or if it was getting too dark, you'd open up, you know, F5.6, you know, uh, all the way down to F2.8, F1.7 to, to kind of uh, to kind of do it that way. So that's how you play with um, taking a basic photo. And then you just, your normal things apply. You've only got, say, 36 or 24 exposures. So just make sure that whatever you do, you know, I always say take take two, take a shot like that, and take a shot like that, um, and you can't really go far wrong. Okay, so once we've been out and about, we've been taking lots of photos, and we come to the end of our roll, it's time to change the roll. Um, <laughs> the critical thing is, is remember, don't open the back until you're sure the film has rewound. So we're going along, we're taking the photos, and we get to the end, and what you'll normally feel, feel is that the, the lever will go slightly hard, slightly difficult to turn. At that point you know, because you, you'll, you'll see on here that it's um, it's run out. Um, and so um, what we've gone, then got to do is rewind the film. Actually, I'm going to show you one more thing that I'd, I'd completely forgotten about. 
when you're using the camera, I don't know whether you can see that little hole there. Watch it change colour as I wind on. Let's see if you can see it. See so it go to orange, that means the shutter's ready to fire. How cool is that? Anyway, so rewinding the film. So we get to the end and we can't wind it anymore. So we know we need to change our film. First thing we want to do is we want to press this button on the bottom here. Because if we press that button there, that now releases the film to be rewound. And then all we do is we pop this top bit off and then we start rewinding it clockwise. And you'll feel the film rewinding. You know, you can physically feel it going back. And you feel it going back. And I'll give you a little hint as well. When it goes slack, I don't want you to keep going. Because if you develop your own film, or to be honest, well, even when you send it to labs, it's really nice if you can leave the header out, especially if you're doing it yourself. Because if you leave the header out, it's a lot easier to pull it out in the dark bag before you put it in the chemicals. And also it really helps people at the labs as well, because they don't have to do the same thing. So that's just gone slack now. So what I can do now is if I now pull this up, what you will find is there's my film and I've got a little bit of the header in. So let's just pop that out like so. I've got my film. If I'm developing it myself, that's really easy to cut that off and put it in the tanks. And the people at the labs will find it really easy to then um, do exactly the same thing without potentially damaging your film. So there we go, that's how you use the Pentax K1000. Fully mechanical, fully clockwork, really easy to use. Um, you can't go wrong, all you need to do is set the ISO of the film that's in, select your aperture, you know, for wandering out. You can't go far wrong with F8 and B there. Look through the viewfinder, change your shutter speed to get the needle in the middle. But again, if, you're, if the light meter doesn't work, don't worry, you can always get a manual light meter and use that, or you can just guess. There's so much latitude in film, it doesn't really matter. So, um, there we go, that's using the Pentax K1000. Now let's um, just have a quick chat about what sort of film you might want to use with it. Okay, so you, you've got your K1000, um, you know, you've kind of seen a little bit of the video where I've shown you how to use it. So let's say, you know, what sort of film, what type of film should you, should you use, or what might you want to think about using? Well, I've kind of, I've got three kind of different films here that you might want to think about. The first one is just traditional color film, um, 35 millimeter. 36 exposure. You can still get this from most supermarkets. Um, uh, probably, <laughs> if you've got a relative, you've probably taken this off. They've probably got some 35 millimeter film um, hanging around. Even if it's exposed, I'd still say shoot it. Obviously, not as something important like a wedding. Um, ISO 100 is finer grained. 200, 400. If you live in the northern hemispheres um and uh you know it's getting pretty dull maybe go for like an iso 400 or something like that but you know most of these uh, k1000 come with like nifty 50s that are pretty fast anyway this is an f1.8 lets in plenty of light so you know here's iso 100. the beauty of using uh, normal color film is that you can take it to your local lab to get it developed you can send it through the post nice and cheap nice and easy the next step i would suggest is something like ilford's xp2 400 now this is actually a black and white film but it's a black and white film with a difference because the XP2400 although it comes out black and white um, actually can be developed well is developed in the same chemicals as your color film so you put this in your camera you shoot it and then you take it to your local lab your local Asda or Walmart or you send it off and they will develop develop it in the same machines that develop this stuff. So it's really simple. It's quite high uh, ISO, it's ISO 400, so it's nice and fast. And it is a really easy, quick way into black and white photography to kind of uh, see, if you, see if you enjoy it and it's something you want to do without having to invest in chemicals and stuff. And then you've got something like Ilford's FP4 Plus 125. Now this is a true traditional black and white film that is developed in black and white chemistry, which is different to the chemistry this used. This is the sort of black and white film you use if you want to develop it yourself at home. You can send it off and get it developed um, at labs and things, um, but you won't be able to take this into your local Asda, your local Walmart. They won't do black and white processing on the yeah, on the premises. They might have a service to send them off, but that tends to be at more uh, in-depth camera shots shops. Sorry. So there we go. I would recommend start off with color. Um, because it really is good. Maybe do a little dabbling with something like Ilford's XP, um, XP2 Super 400 so you get black and white film but with the convenience of, um, of uh, colour 
uh, developing uh, technology. And then if you really get into it and you want to develop your own film, go for something like Ilford FP4 Plus 125, which is a really smooth, creamy black and white film that looks absolutely fantastic. So there we go. There's some ideas for what sort of film you might want to use with your Pentax K1000. Okay, so hopefully I've whetted your appetite for the Pentax um, K1000. Um, hopefully I've given you a good idea why it's such a pleasant camera to use, such a great camera to use actually, um, and you know where you should think about buying one, checking one, and how to use it. I love my K1000. Um, I like shooting with it, and I wish I guess I had time to shoot with it more. Um, so if you do see a good cheap example that looks like everything seems to be working, you know, snap it up. Um, you definitely won't be sorry. There we go. The Pentax K1000, fantastic 35mm film SLR for beginners and advanced photographers as well. They are very, very enjoyable to use and uh, I hope to get many years uh, shooting out of mine um, in the time to come. Okay, so that's it from me. Uh, my name is Rob from RobinandPhoto.com. Remember, if you like the videos, please um, hit the thumbs up, please subscribe, put some comments down below. You can email me scalespeeder at gmail.com and uh, maybe I'll see you again soon.